invite you to turn uh, in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, to chapter number 17, and to come back to the passage that uh, spoke to you last uh, Lord's Day on. The title of the message is uh, The Big Three of Discipleship. This is uh, obviously part two. Uh, I want to begin reading at uh, verse 17. Thankful for our singing this morning, all of the hymns, um, the special. Uh, we, we depend upon God's mercy uh, for sure uh, in our uh, lives uh, as disciples of Jesus. Um, God is good to us in blessing us uh, even when we fail him. And that's been the wonderful message here. This message, though, uh, is, is the other, other part, I suppose, in our responsibilities as disciples of Jesus. And uh, God is gracious to us, and yet he has expectations for us. And so that's what I want to uh, speak upon uh, this morning. Well, let's look now and let me read to you, um, beginning at verse 1 of Luke chapter 17. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith, I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Would you notice in your bulletin now a responsive reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, and notice in the bold print there is where you will respond. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Let's pray. Dear Father, we come before you now, seeking now your blessings to be upon us in the preaching of the word and in the hearing of it. We know, as we have read, that the things of this world shall wither and fall away as the grass does. But your word is not of this world. 
And so it will stand forever. Come now, we pray, O Holy Spirit, You who gave inspiration to the writers, to Luke here, and writing down, pinning the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ Himself. Would You come now and bless us with ears to hear and eyes to see what it is that our Lord here is speaking to His disciples there in that day and what He is speaking to us here today. Come, we pray, we need you. Help me, I pray, that I might give the sense of the Word and all of its truthfulness. And then bless these ones, O Lord, to hear you speaking to them, bringing conviction, O Lord, if that is your will, but also bringing encouragement as well. Come now, O Holy Spirit, help us, we pray. We need you. For this we pray, along with the forgiveness for our sins, in the name of Christ, the living word. And amen. We, as I said, return to this passage from Luke to consider the three responsibilities laid upon us as disciples of Jesus, and I've called them the big three because of their importance. In the progression of the disciple of Jesus to become more like Jesus. As I made mention of the passage from Romans last week in Romans chapter 8, we are predestined by God, that is, God has predestined that those who are in Christ, that those who are in union with Christ, those who have been called by God and given spiritual life, that God has predestined, that God has determined that they would be conformed to the image of His Son. And this work only by the grace of the Lord, is a work that is going on right now. This confirmation to the image of Christ does not happen all at once. Disciples of Jesus will never attain the fullness of being like unto the image of Jesus that is perfect in holiness, free from the corruption of sin, on this side of heaven. The finality of the work of confirmation will only be realized in that day in which we are glorified, when we are resurrected. But this glorious change for the disciple of Jesus, this process of confirmation begins when we are given new hearts when we are made spiritually alive, when we are quickened, as the Bible says, unto life, spiritual life, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it is through the continual ministry of the Holy Spirit that we are becoming more and more and more like Jesus. And so we here today who have been born again, we are under construction. We are works in progress. And what we see here in this passage is that this ongoing work of being conformed to the image of Christ, to be like Jesus, is either hampered by or helped by how we respond to the big three here of sin, faith, and service. Now, in in the message from last Sunday, we considered really only getting to the first two of the big three. That is that we must overcome sin 
And we must effectively employ the faith that is given to us. And so I just want to say just a few words to you by way of review here. First, we note that Jesus said that offenses will come. I, I'm, I'm like Brother Wade, as he mentioned a few moments ago. We, we fail. We fail constantly. Um, it, is, it is the product of our still being uh, here in this world, this fallen world. We still have, uh, in, in a way, Adam in us. But we ought to remember that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That is, we have Christ in us now as well. So we are not held captive to sin as we were before uh, this great gift of, of being born again, of being given spiritual life here. And what Jesus is saying, if you look at verse 1 here, he says unto his disciples, it is impossible that offenses will come. It is impossible but that offenses will come. That is, scandals will come. That, that word in the Greek for offense there is the word scandalon. And, and it, it, from which we get our word scandal. And, and that word carries the thought of entrapment or to be trapped or to ensnare. And so what Jesus is saying here is, is that the opportunities for sin and to sin will always be present with us as we live here on this side of glory. There will always be impediments placed before us. Sometimes we place the impediments ourselves. But sometimes others place those impediments before us that would entrap us, that would be a snare to us. And Jesus' words here to his disciples are first of all a warning. And then there is a directive given, a command that is given as to how one deals with such offenses when they arise. When they arise and not if they arise. The warning here is, of, is, is for one not to be the, the source for the scandal. Because Jesus says here, but woe unto him through whom they come. And then he goes on and says, it's better that you hang a millstone about your neck and that you would be cast into the sea than that you would offend, that you would scandalize these little ones, and I made reference to little ones there, could be talking about children. He said that at times, but I suspect that it's more general than that. He's talking about all his children. You see, we are not to be the source of scandal like Judas was. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. Just as judgment came to Judas, so will it come to those who are the sources of scandal. And to those who are, uh, have, are on the receiving end of, of the scandal, of the offenses, Jesus calls upon them to do something as well, and that is to forgive. To forgive if, the, if it says here, if the, if the offender repents, if he is sorry for what he has done, then you are, to, you are to forgive him. Even if he does it seven times in, in a day, you are to forgive. And if he does not ask for forgiveness, you still are to forgive. As the example of our Lord Jesus Christ was, as I made mention upon the cross, as he looks upon the people who are responsible for putting him there. Yes, God as we know, in, in, uh, it was God's will for all of that to happen, but still the people were responsible for that great sin. And, God, and Jesus said what? For Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, we are not to uh, have hardened hearts uh, as a result of people offending us because it does our own soul in a, in a bad way. And so we are to forgive. So there are the offenses that are certain to come. And then we notice, as we were singing, trusting Jesus. 
that we must employ the faith that is given to us. Because the disciples, in responding to Jesus by saying, you ought to forgive them even if they sin against you seven times, how can you do that? And, and, and we ask the same question. And these disciples are, are, are wondering at what Jesus, these words of Jesus, and they are saying, how is that possible? And so uh, I understand in the context here, that's what they're saying. Father, increase our faith, Lord. And then that brings the response of Jesus in verse 6. If you had the faith of a grain of a mustard seed. And, and how small is the mustard seed? How small is the grain of a mustard seed? But Jesus says, if you had faith, even the size of a grain of mustard seed, then you can tell a tree, the sycamine tree or the mulberry tree, to, to, to be plucked up. And be put into the sea and it should obey you. See, and the point here I want to remind you of is that it's not the amount of faith that one has. It is the fact that you have faith. And that you use the faith that you have. That is a gift of God. All who are born again, all who have spiritual life are given faith. In our eyes, we think we need a lot of faith. And that's what the disciples here are, are looking at. They're, they're thinking they don't have the, enough faith in order to do what Christ has called them to do. But Jesus is saying no. As I was thinking about this, I, I thought of the example of Peter in that wonderful miracle of him getting out of the boat the same faith that he had in order to get out of the boat and to actually walk upon the sea. Somehow, did he lose that faith? No, what happened was his eyes left the object of his faith. And so, he began to sink. And Jesus, of course, reached down his hand and pulled him back up. I, I, what the point here is the same faith that he had faith. Peter had faith. Peter was not walking on the water by his own strength, uh, by his own power. And, and in, in a sense, even by his own faith as he had it, but it was through the strength and the power of Christ. His faith was sufficient for him to do this great miracle, but he chose not to employ it fully by looking to Christ. He began to look at his circumstances. You and I, as the redeemed of the Lord, are given the gift of faith. It matters not how much you think you have or how little we think we have, but rather it matters that we use it and that we never lose sight of the object of our faith, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we must employ our faith, the faith that we have, believing that it is in Christ that all things are possible for us. And that's the lesson that Jesus gives to his disciples here. Now we come to this final one of the big three, and that is our service. Our service to God. How are we to view our service to God? Now look at verse 7 here. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank the servant? That is, doth the master thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? And, and in the King James it says, I trow not. And, and of course we would probably say it today, well, no. <laughs> That's not the case. So, likewise ye. And so now here is the, here is the teaching principle of Jesus. And, and teaching his disciples how they are to look at 
their service. He says, so likewise ye, when ye have done all of those things which are commanded, you say, we are but unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. Now, several things to consider here to note, and that is the nature or character of our service to God is here described in terms of the master servant slave relationship. Now, I think in today's culture that might be offensive to people. Many who are of the so-called cancel culture of today. But let's face it, brothers and sisters, Jesus is using this illustration of the master-servant or the master and slave relationship to make the point of how we ought to see ourselves in relation to our work as disciples of Jesus Christ. We see that in Jesus' words in verse 10, don't we? He says, so likewise ye. Slavery existed in biblical times, in the days in which Jesus lived. It was part of that culture. Many had to sell themselves to others uh, for reasons of survival. Because of severe poverty conditions. I suppose this was perhaps more uh, known as indentured servants. But still, nevertheless, it was slavery. And there were certain expectations that existed, certain obligations that were clearly known uh, among uh, those who were slaves as well as those who were masters. The servant or slave knew what was required of them. They were workers. They were bound to do, they were obligated to do what their master had called for them to do. And certainly there were opportunities for mistreatment. And that no doubt occurred. That occurred because of why? Because offenses occur. Sin still occurs yet despite such offenses the servant here was expected to carry out their duties and to do so without thoughts of being recognized for it brothers and sisters we see once again the greatest expression i think of this master servant relationship that is being talked about here in our lord jesus christ himself who voluntarily laid aside the glory He had with the Father from from all eternity to become what? A servant. That same Greek word that is given here in our text for servant, the word doulos, is given in that text in Philippians chapter 2 where it speaks of God the Son taking on the form of a servant, a slave. So Jesus is not telling us to be something that He Himself was not in His incarnation. He, as the Apostle Paul wrote, took on the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. Jesus subjected Himself to the will of His Father to do the work that His Father sent Him into this world to do, and He did it. He was faithful. He was obedient. And that is the mindset. That is the mindset that we as the disciples of Jesus to have. For Paul said in that same passage in in, in Philippians chapter 2, he says, let this mind be in you which that was also in Christ Jesus. You see, we, we need, we must have the mind of a servant, the mind of a slave. And we are also to remember that we have been redeemed. We have been bought 
as it were, by Jesus. We have been bought with a price. We are not our own, but we belong to Him. He is our Lord. He is our Master. And it's here Jesus says, there is not this expectation that a slave here in the employment of his pastor, that a uh, master rather, that once he finishes his work in the fields, that now he's going to sit down and have at the table there and have his meal before the master eats. It, see, it doesn't work that way. But it is after the master eats, that is when the time of the servant to eat, that's when he eats. And so, likewise, Jesus says, are you my disciples? You are to live out your lives. You are to do the work expected of you as servants of mine. Do your duty. Fulfill your obligations as my disciples. And, and what are those obligations? Love God. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You, as the body of Christ, we as the body of Christ are to work in the fields that are white unto harvest. We are called upon by our Master to be His witnesses unto others. We are called upon to make disciples. That's our duty. He has called us to. We are called to be living sacrifices of God. We are called upon not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This is what we are called upon to do. And these things that we are called upon to do, we do so with a heart of humility, with a humble spirit, as Jesus Himself showed when He bowed down to wash the feet the dirty feet of his disciples. And when he gave himself to be sacrificed on the cross. Jesus goes on to say here, and when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, look at me. Are we to be like the Pharisee in the temple? I, I can't help but remember all of you who were involved with the Godspell production of a number of years ago. I think it was Rachel who was bouncing up on the trampoline with the idea, look at me, look at me. And that's what the parable uh, uh, here the, the, of, the, of the Pharisee, look at, look at me. It's almost like he was saying, God, look at me. Look what I've done for you. I tithe. You know, I fast. Twice a week. I do this. I do that. As if he thinks that God owes him something. Do we think God owes us something? Well, if you think that, what you ought to think that he owes you is condemnation. You should think he owes you his wrath. No, we owe God. We owe God. He does not owe us. We owe Him our very life. We owe Him our love. 
We owe Him our obedience. We owe Him our service. We owe Him our worship. And when it's all said and done, if you are to live out the rest of your life, if God blesses you with 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of being in His service, at the end of that time, you ought to come to say, what I have done, I have done because of Him. I am an unprofitable servant. That's the mindset. That's, that's the attitude. That's the character of our service. Sin, faith, service. These are the big three of Christian discipleship. And as we close, let me ask you here this morning, how are you dealing with the offenses that come in living in a fallen world? How are you responding to those offenses? I pray that you are not the source of offenses. And if you are, if you have offended someone, if you have put an impediment in the way of someone that would cause them to fall into sin, repent. Repent. And if someone has offended you, forgive. Forgive. How is your faith? You have it. If you are born again, if you believe that Christ Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, because if you believe that, then that's proof of you being born again. No one can say that Jesus is the Christ, that He is the anointed of God, except that He have life. If you believe that, then you must believe you have faith. Because faith is a gift that is given to you by God. Use it. It's not a matter of what, how much you think you have, or, but it's a matter that you have it. Look to the object of your faith. Don't look at faith itself as, you, as that which you or will depend upon. No, it's, 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 it's Christ. It's the object. He's the object of your faith. How, are, how is your faith this morning? And how would you describe your service? How would you describe your service to God? You and I have been accounted as worthy of receiving grace and what we sang about mercy this morning. You and, I, you and I have merited nothing when it comes to receiving the blessings of God. How is your service? I read to you the, in the beginning the words of the psalmist, and let me read those words now at the end of the message. Let's echo these words, brothers and sisters, of the psalmist. If I ask you to respond to this message today, respond in this way. What shall I render unto the Lord for all of His benefits? Towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. That's the way you can respond if you haven't responded before. Acknowledge Christ as your Savior and then pledge to honor Him for the salvation that He has given to you by serving Him. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows. Isn't that how we ought to consider our service to God? 
It is a vow that we make. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all His people. There is something to being together, brothers and sisters, in the worship service. We are saying to one another, we are giving our testimony of what Christ has done for us. This is the bond, this is the, this is the tie that binds us all together. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of the people. Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant. It's mentioned twice here by the psalmist. Point of emphasis, right? That's usually when it's, things are repeated, it's for emphasis. I am thy servant. Look at yourself as the servant of God. The son of thy handmaid, thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I, and then he says that once again, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Sin, faith, and service. These are the big three of discipleship. How we deal with each of these will determine how we progress in our walk as disciples of Jesus. And I'm not discounting, brothers and sisters, the work of God and His mercy and grace to give us what we need, but we are responsible. We have responsibilities before God to honor our commitments. When we fail, it's not because God fails. It's because we do. I pray that we will honor the Lord and follow His commandments as He is given, as they are given here in this text. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I do pray now that Father, You will cause us right now, to reflect upon our own service, our own life as a disciple. Lord, I would confess that, that I am not what I ought to be, that, that I should be more. Forgive me. Forgive me for my, my failures to live as you require for me to. Lord, let us all look deep within our own selves. And if we are found to be wanting, then write that upon our hearts so that we may be convicted and move to greater service, to greater devotion, for you are worthy. Help us at Lane's Church, Lord, to be more and more like your son Jesus. It's my prayer in Jesus' name, and amen.